All right, good morning guys. Hope you are doing awesome and had a great weekend. So this week we're gonna start with the phytochemicals. Um, I would say one of the reasons why I'm teaching first year raw med is because uh, I think I love, or I do love phytochemicals. And I think what's interesting about phytochemicals is that's where all the magic uh, exists in uh, herbal medicine. And also a lot of the benefits of a, a whole foods plant-based diet comes down to not just the avoidance of animal products, but rather the non-essential nutrients that are found in plants. And what I love about um, herbal medicine and diet is the fact that it's it's just orchestra of phytochemicals working together synergistically to uh, make us healthy. And so, um, although I do sometimes prescribe a supplement that may be high dose in a particular nutrient, a vitamin or a mineral or whatever it may be. I always begin with the diet. And that's the most important thing because um, most supplements that you get, if you buy a vitamin C um, supplement, it's rarely going to have all the other hundreds of phytochemicals that are showing benefit for various diseases. So uh, phytochemistry is really, really interesting. Um, my background's in biochemistry, uh, kind of I uh, almost did a minor in chemistry. The only reason why I didn't is I didn't want to take quantum chemistry and have my class out or have my uh, overall average get dragged down because everyone fails the course. But uh, I worked as a synthetic chemist for a while. I was an organic chemist uh, in a lab making various things. I took courses in uh, natural products courses at university, which is decades ago. And so I naturally just enjoy the phytochemical section because I have a chemistry background. That being said, you don't need to know any of the structures of the chem chemicals. Um, I will give you specific questions uh, and try to be clear on what I expect. You do have to know the differences between some of the phytochemicals. Um, and I'll explain that But uh, as we go, what types of questions you might expect. But it's more the functional aspects of it than the actual, uh, you know, um, being able to recognize the structures and, and things like that. Now, when I'm reading about a herbal monograph, or I read a herbal monograph, and a herbal monograph is basically kind of like a, a little summary of what you might use that plant for, that herb for. And uh, often it'll contain a list of phytochemicals that are in it. And uh, now I may use the term phytochemicals, constituents, those are to be used interchangeably in case I'm using one uh, or the other. And so when you look at the constituents, which is the individual uh, compounds that make up the particular herb or plant, um, if I see certain compounds in it that I recognize, if I see the structure, but I can look and I go, oh, I have an idea that it's going to have some antioxidant properties and probably some anti-inflammatory or another type of compounds. I, I've seen enough herbs that there's a bit of a pattern recognition, and I might be able to de deduce um, how it works or maybe the indications for it um, and it gives me another perspective on the herbs that someone else may not have that being said you don't need to know phytochemicals to be a successful herbalist i know that sounds kind of weird for me to say because i'm going to teach you and make you pass the exam and everything else but in reality Herbalists have been prescribing herbs for you know, thousands of years without understanding the phytochemicals. However, in my opinion, knowing the phytochemicals will make you a better naturopathic doctor because it may give you a better understanding on how to uh, predict certain interactions or how to compound herbal formulas so that there is less redundancy in it. And when I'm making a herbal formula, I try not to combine uh, herbs that have the exact same type of type of phytochemicals in it that work um, the same way um, because it kind of creates more of a cumulative effect rather than maybe a synergistic effect. Um, so it's good to know these phytochemicals. It's good to understand the pharmacology and how they might work a little bit. But what I'm going to teach you is a very, unfortunately, superficial sort of understanding of these because um, you could you know, spend hours just learning about uh, one one specific phytochemical, literally hours. Um, you could do a PhD on just one group of phytochemicals, right? So 
we can't cover it all, but we'll do what we can to kind of give a nice introduction to it. And then when you're learning about herbs um, in second and third year, um, and hopefully when you graduate, you're going to want to continue to learn about herbs that um, you'll have that foundation in place. Okay. So the main goals of the uh, phytochemical section is to understand how these phytochemicals are classified and to make a connection between certain groups or classes of phytochemicals and medicinal actions that they have. So we're trying to look for generalizations and I'm going to use common examples that you've probably already heard of that you would find in your diet uh, as much as possible and then link it to some other herbs that you may not know but will need to know at some point. Um, and that's kind of the goal. So understanding phytochemicals, how we classify them, what actions are often associated with them, and then a couple of common examples that you might see in your diet or with sort of the archetypal or classic herbs that would contain them. Okay. So phytochemicals are basically compounds that are produced by plants. I mean, you can probably figure that out on your own. And what's really neat about herbs is that they contain hundreds of different phytochemicals in them. And there's rarely just one phytochemical in the plant that is responsible for its medicinal properties. There will be numerous phytochemicals and maybe slightly different variations of it. Like even with turmeric, the main compound in turmeric is curcumin, that yellow compound. And that's the one that gets all the attention. But in the turmeric plant, there are more than just one curcuminoid, which are other compounds similar to curcumin. And they all have anti-inflammatory effects and maybe slightly different effects. In addition to that, there will be essential oils in the turmeric plant that can potentially exert some of its medicinal properties, and I know it does for a fact. And there's even other compounds that are classified as carbohydrates that exert an immunomodulating anti-inflammatory effect. And so you have a whole bunch of different things working together uh, to exert their effect. And so when you buy a product that is 99% curcumin, it may be a great product and it may have similar actions to turmeric, which contains dozens or hundreds of different phytochemicals in it, but it's not the same. It may be better because maybe you get better absorption. Maybe it's more concentrated, so you have a stronger anti-inflammatory effect or an anti-cancer effect that you may desire. Or maybe it could be more toxic because it's too high a concentration. I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying it could be. Uh, or maybe it doesn't work as well. So appreciate, once you start isolating a particular phytochemical, it will work differently than the whole plant. And just because the research has been done on one chemical doesn't mean that there aren't other things that are important in that plant. Because often research is still relatively uh, unexplored in the realm of herbal medicine. I mean, lots of studies exist, but I think there's tons of things that we're going to learn in the next 20 years that I didn't know about when I graduated. Because already I can say it's been exponential, like I showed you last time. So. Um, when you look at the benefits um, of a whole foods plant-based diet, as I mentioned before, all the nutrients, vitamins and the minerals, those are really important to prevent scurvy, beriberi, pellagra, <coughs> uh, rickets, all these various uh, diseases that can arise from a deficiency of, of essential nutrients. And so you could just eat protein powder that has the macronutrients, which is the protein, fats, and carbohydrates, and the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals, and be able to stay alive. But I can't imagine you do very well on that diet because it would be lacking all the non-essential nutrients. And these are what those phytochemicals are. And these are the magical things that help prevent cancer, heart disease, diabetes, yada, yada, yada. Okay? And as I mentioned a couple of slides ago or one slide ago, is that the phytochemicals are responsible for the herbal actions. And you know, as magical as, I mean, to me, I think, uh, I think herbs and herbal medicine, um, it's a, it's a really fun, magical field because what I love about herbal medicine is that, um, it brings in culture 
into plants. And that's one of the reasons why I like plants is that we every culture has plants associated with them. And there's a really fascinating history that is around it. And some of it's based on you know superstition and and uh, mythology, um, but also a lot of it's rooted in in uh, empirical knowledge and and uh, and now there's some science to back this stuff up. And one of the things that, unlike uh, some uh, medical disciplines like um, Bach flower remedies and homeopathy, um, and uh, I'm trying to think of some other things, uh, but those the tissue salts and some of these um, forms of medicine, which uh, it's believed that you can remove some sort of you can remove the phytochemicals and, and somehow contain uh the medical properties or the medicinal properties of that plant without including any of the uh chemicals in it um is yet to be proven um that's that's i would say that scientific community overwhelmingly uh would say that those treatments are uh, placebo based things and placebo is a magical thing. If you haven't uh, ever read it, go read it. Uh, go, you can just go to Wikipedia and read about placebo and appreciate the fact that you give an inert substance to someone, a lot of people get better. And one of the cool things, like you look at antidepressants, four out of ten respond to uh, placebo, six out of ten respond to drugs. Um, so that's a lot of actual real effect that can occur by giving an inert substance. And so things like homeopathy and Bach flower, without a doubt, have some benefits some of the time on some people, um, whether you want to, whether it's placebo or not. These uh, effects on their lives uh, are observed by the clinicians. But I would challenge, I don't believe that it's the mechanism of actions related to the energy has been extracted from the plant uh, once the chemicals are removed. I just don't believe that. I don't think the science exists for that. Um, and you don't have to believe what I say. You can you can uh, make up your own decision on these things. Um, but those therapies, I do, I want to emphasize, people see benefit from getting, from taking them sometimes. Okay. And that's why practitioners continue to use them because one, they're not as toxic and dangerous as drugs are. And two, they work a percentage of the time. Okay. Or at least they yeah, they, I mean, I think they do work a percentage of the time. But I appreciate that even systems of medicine like Ayurvedic medicine and traditional Chinese medicine, which is not a reductionistic form of medicine, but a holistic medicine that looks at the energetic effects of the plant, um, they don't, I mean, any Chinese practitioner would probably laugh at you if you said you can somehow extract the energy from the plant without actually uh, consuming. The plant because when they give you herbal formulas in traditional Chinese medicine, you could literally be taking 30 grams of herbs in a water decoction per day, and uh, you're you're drinking a lot of phytochemicals when you do that, uh, and it's all those those dependent. So my background is pharmacology, and every single study shows that as you increase the dose of a particular substance, the effects increase. And so coming back to the phytochemicals. If you don't have enough phytochemicals in your tea, your tincture, whatever, it may still work by exerting a placebo effect, but you won't get the benefits of doing the correct amount in the right ratios. Okay. And understanding how phytochemicals work and, and some of the properties will also give you an appreciation that if you're trying to uh, extract some of the fat soluble components and you take a tea, you may not be able to dissolve the active ingredients that you want and administer it to have a therapeutic effect. Okay, so not only do you have to have enough of the starting material, but the extraction process is important. And then also things affect the absorption of other things. Okay. So um, so when it comes to phytochemicals, if you're practicing herbal medicine, you need to have enough of phytochemicals in your body because what these little phytochemicals do as I showed you in the first lecture is when you absorb them they interact with receptors in your body and it could be uh, an estrogen receptor in the case of soy or it could be uh, cyclooxygenase enzyme 
uh, that inhibits to decrease inflammation in the case of uh, uh, salicylic acid from aspirin from willow. Um, so there's lots of different ways that these, these things work, and that's what pharmacology does, is it tries to understand the specific mechanisms. Now, appreciate there's also some problems when you start trying to rely entirely on pharmacology, is if you have hundreds of phytochemicals in the plant with dozens of them potentially having uh, some kind of mechanism of action, uh, if you focus on only one chemical, you are excluding the other things. So becoming too reductionistic in your thinking can also be a fault. You know? So if you can understand it from a holistic model, but then also understand it from the reductionistic model, I think your knowledge and your competency to prescribe herbs is only greater. You know, so uh, so the herbal actions associated with phytochemicals, to the best of my knowledge, there is no uh, there's no way to extract it. You know, you know, people argue we're getting into the realm of quantum physics when you start talking about extracting the energy from herbs and everything else. But I don't know if that exists. Okay, uh, if it does, uh, you know, I don't know. Anyways, uh, and as I mentioned before. Different phytochemicals have different polarities. And what polarity means is whether it's water soluble or fat soluble. And it's not a black and white thing. It can either be a little bit water soluble and a little bit fat soluble. And in that case, you want to find a solvent that matches that phytochemical to do the extraction. So alcohol is often used to extract herbs because you have a compound like ethanol, which is both somewhat water soluble and somewhat fat soluble, more water soluble than fat soluble. So you will get some. Uh, uh, non-polar compounds, which are more fat-soluble compounds, dissolving in alcohol, okay? Uh, and this gets complicated, but we'll explain some of this more later on, okay? So, when it comes to classifying herbs, uh, there are different ways that you can do that, as we mentioned before. Um, you can classify them by the system, by their actions, by their geography. Um, Human beings like to put things in a little boxes and try to understand it. And it's just a, an easier way for us to process the information. But some of these ways of classifying herbs and herbal actions are pretty arbitrary and they don't always mean a whole lot. Um, but we're going to do it anyways, okay? So some of the compounds we're going to talk about, we classify them based on how they're made, their synthetic pathways, okay? Uh, we might talk about their phytochemical structure. So if something contains a phenol group, which is a benzene ring with an OH group, those are called phenolics. Everyone's heard of phenolic compounds, I'm sure, or polyphenols, okay? Um, or we might classify it based on the fact that you can uh, use steam distillation to evaporate the essential oils for small volatile compounds in it. Uh, so volatile oil, essential oil, same word. Um, might be classified by that. Sometimes it's even they're even classified by their medicinal action or their, their, their the action that these compounds have. And likely um, certain phytochemicals can fall under two or more of these categories. Okay, so it doesn't mean that if something is a terpenoid that it can't be a phenol or a monoclonal oil. To give you an example, so here's kind of a visual picture that I've created. So the green is a group of compounds called terpenoids. The purple on the right are compounds called phenolics. And then you have this overlapping group called essential oils, where essential oils can be terpenoids, essential oils can be phenolics, and then there's a spot where a compound could be a terpenoid, an essential oil, and a phenolic compound, so it fits under all three categories. And one example of that would be a compound uh, called uh, thymol or carvacol. That's the active ingredients in oregano oil. And oregano oil is an essential oil. It's made through the terpenoid pathway. It contains a phenolic uh, uh, ring structure in it. Okay? So you can have multiple classifications that apply to the same compounds. And there you go. So it's just kind of a 
that's a nice visualization of kind of one way that these systems of classification can overlap. To give you another example would be not with phytochemicals, but you could have, if you were to classify an animal, you could classify it by the fact that um, using the fact that it's a mammal and it's a feline. So a mammal, subcategory feline, that would be one way to classify. You could also classify it whether it's a domestic animal or whether it's a wild animal. And so uh, a tabby cat uh, would be a mammal, not a reptile. It would be a feline, not a canine. And it would be a domestic animal, not a wild animal. So uh, a lion wouldn't fall under that, but a house cat would, okay? So I think that makes, makes sense to you guys, I hope. Any questions on that before we move on? So carbohydrates. So a lot of the time when you think about, I think when the average hears about carbohydrates, they think bad, bad, bad. Carbohydrate, carbohydrates are bad for you. And that's true. But carbohydrates are good for you as well. And one thing I'll say is when you look at diets like a ketogenic diet, which is basically high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate diet, and people use this to lose weight and they balance diabetes. They tend to they'll eat bacon and cheese and and steak and all, all these really heavy, rich foods in with very very little carbohydrate at all. And people will lose weight. So that sounds like a good thing. But the research shows that these people die earlier. And that's a bad thing. So you do lose some weight, but you die sooner, uh, especially if you're eating a lot of animal products. If you're eating plant plant products, you People do it much better and actually probably kind of a healthy way thing to do. So obviously carbohydrates can't be that bad if a low carbohydrate diet is very bad. And both a high fat and a high protein diet, which tend to be low in carbohydrates, are not healthy for people. Uh, people find that they just die sooner from various things if you're eating a lot of animal products. Now, a whole foods plant-based diet tends to be high in carbohydrates, low in protein, low in fats. So why is it that a, a diet like that, a whole foods plant-based diet, actually prevents diabetes, actually uh, lowers the risk for cancer, and cancer feed on carbohydrates. Excess carbohydrates cause diabetes, right? So appreciate carbohydrates, it's a chemical term. It's what biochemists use to describe a chemical structure. It does not relate to the function of what the different types of carbohydrates do. So, um, so it's it's not it's it's a it's an unfortunate biochemical term that the general public have heard because we basically say that uh, something that's rich in carbohydrates is bad. Yes, in the case of potato chips, it's bad. In the case of white bread, it's bad. But in the case of sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes are good for it. Uh, if it has resistant starch in it. In the case of something like even flax seeds have a lot of carbohydrates, but it's all fiber. The fiber is good for you. So carbohydrates have lots of different effects. As a macronutrient, carbohydrates are rich in complex and simple sugar molecules um, that your body can use as a fuel. Technically speaking, you do not need carbohydrates to generate energy in the body, but having a whole foods-based diet that has unprocessed carbohydrates has been shown to be healthy, while eating a lot of processed carbohydrates is bad for you, okay? Now, what a carbohydrate is, is basically they have a little formula for it that contains a carbon and a hydrogen and an oxygen with the following, with the formula shown on the right there, okay? That's a biochemical term for it. Now, something to appreciate with carbohydrates is they're water soluble. And I think everybody knows that when you add a carbohydrate to water, you take a spoonful of sugar to add the water, it dissolves. Okay. And the reason why carbohydrates are water soluble is because they contain a lot of oxygen molecules. And oxygen molecules, when you see them stuck on a, 
uh, that's biochemical or any kind of structure means that it's going to be a little bit soluble in water if you have a little bit of oxygen. And if you have a lot of oxygens, it's going to be really water soluble. So the polarity of a compound is directly dependent primarily on oxygen, but you can also have an effect with sulfur and nitrogens as well. Okay. So compounds that contain um, oxygens tend to be polar. Okay. Now, obviously, you could have like a fatty acid, uh, like oleic acid, which is one of the fatty acids that's found in olive oil. It has one oxygen molecule and a whole bunch of carbons, okay, 18 carbons all together. And so the relative ratio of carbons to oxygens in that case is like 18 to 2, you know, so, uh, so 1 to 9. When you look at the ratio of carbons to oxygens in a carbohydrate, it's like 1 to 1. And that's why carbohydrates tend to be so water soluble, okay? A lot of them are. Not all of them, a lot of them are, okay? Um, so, what, what do carbohydrates do? One, they're a fuel source. So, we're not talking about that because we're not talking about nutrition right now. We're talking about phytochemicals. So, in the case of non-essential nutrients or other phytochemicals that have medicinal properties, uh, carbohydrates have different roles. One, they can act as a glycoside. And what that means is you take any phytochemical that has an OH group on it, uh, you can stick on a carbohydrate onto that molecule. And what it does at that point is it makes it more water soluble. And there's certain advantages of doing that. And there's a reason why plants and also animals uh, form what are called glycosides. Okay. We'll come back to that in a second. So, um, so there's glycosides. We'll talk about in a second. Different forms of fiber, there's soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. One of the reasons why a whole foods plant diet, plant-based diet is good for people is because it's unprocessed, there's a lot of fiber in it. And that's probably one of the reasons why there is not an increased risk of diabetes eating a really high carbohydrate diet because that fiber helps to uh, buffer the body and help to prevent major spikes in the blood sugar, okay? Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, other phytochemicals, uh, so fiber is important from a, in my opinion, it's an essential nutrient, although I don't know if it actually is classified as that. I, I, I certainly think that you have to have fiber in your diet um, um, to exist. And, and we evolved probably consuming over, some people say over 100 grams of fiber a day, um, some even higher than that. Oh. Hi, thanks, Mary. You're welcome. Sure. That's how we start. Mary bringing me a cup of coffee. Isn't she lovely? Um, that's one of the advantages of having it. Actually, you know what? Not all receptionists would do that for you. Just Tamara's amazing. So, um, if you can find yourself a Tamara when you go to clinic, you'd be very lucky. So, um, so anyway, going back to uh, fiber. Fiber acts through different mechanisms. Uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, it can promote bowel movements, but there's also some additional properties that can occur. And when it exists in the form of mucilage, it can protect your mucous membranes and have a, exert a positive effect that way. Uh, gels also exist, which is kind of like a mucilage, just like a slimy, uh, uh, fibrous sort of uh, liquid that can exert some, some positive effects through various mechanisms. Okay. So, um, what are the medicinal actions associated with carbohydrates? There are numerous. I think I've got the main ones down. Uh, one, it can act as a food source for you, a fuel source or an energy source. Because what carbohydrates are, uh, when you think about like something like glucose molecules, um, you're basically taking sunlight, which is you know, energy, and you are converting it into chemical bonds in basically what a, what's a little battery. So sugar molecules are basically, it's, they're batteries. Or maybe, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a battery or, or little sticks of dynamite in some way because they're actually quite unstable compounds. And one of the problems why sugar is so bad is when you consume it, 
when you have relatively high amounts floating around through your body, um, they will bump into various proteins and nerves and uh, arteries or whatever it is and kind of explode and stick to it and react to it um, and caramelize these joints. And that's why diabetes is so bad for your kidneys because it basically starts knocking out your kidneys and sugar starts knocking out um, your arteries and increases your risk for heart disease and knocks out your nerves so you can't feel your fingers and toes and your uh, and uh, and then the men, they often will get erectile dysfunction, which nobody wants them. And so elevated blood sugar when it's uncontrolled is really, really bad. And that's why a high carbohydrate diet based on uh, post-up foods so bad for you is that um, those carbohydrates do not have the normal checks and balances uh, designed to prevent sort of sugar toxicity, okay? So sugars feed you carbohydrates feed you hopefully in a nice slow release fashion you know um you know you don't want to like think about when your automobile works uh it uses gasoline that slowly releases small amounts of uh gasoline uh in a controlled fashion to get the engine to run um and it's pretty safe if you were to take a can of gasoline and drop a match in it and it didn't have that controlled situation, it would be an explosion. And that's kind of what sugar is in your body. You know, maybe not to that extreme, but you get much of it. You understand what I'm saying. Okay. Now, in addition uh, to feeding you, it also has exerts a positive effect on your gut flora. Or also it could be a negative effect depending on how you look at it. So when you consume sugars or fiber, it will naturally feed certain bugs in your diet. And sugars can feed things maybe undesirable like yeast and other bugs, uh, while fiber tends to encourage the growth of more desirable bugs in your system. So one of the reasons why that whole food plant-based diet is so good for people, and you're probably going to get sick of me saying that word, is because high amounts of the fiber means you're feeding good bacteria. And you may have heard that one of the problems with taking probiotics is it's really hard to shift uh, to get those probiotics to colonize your gut because the uh, little houses in your gut where the bugs live, they're already occupied. So the probiotics can only exert kind of a, a, a temporary effect on it while you're taking it. So they're more like tourists traveling through, you know, Muskoka's in the summertime. They don't actually live there in the wintertime. And once they leave, they, their influence on the economy and on local life and everything uh, goes away. Uh, but they certainly have an effect. You know, when it comes to if you want to change who's living in that community, uh, you got to, you know, you got to feed them, create jobs, you know, all these other things. In the case of your gut flora, by eating lots of carbohydrates in the form of fiber, you actually encourage the growth of certain bugs that are desirable. And on the flip side, if you only eat McDonald's for two weeks straight, lots of sugar and processed and meats and these things, these tend to encourage the growth of undesirable bugs and will cause the extinction of desirable bugs. So when you want to make your guts healthy, it's not just things that are good for you as a mammal but it's also what foods you're going to support the growth of desirable bugs in the gut okay and so basically if you're eating lots of fiber and other things like phytochemicals the phenolic compounds like anthocyanidins uh they seem to feed the gut uh and other things so lots of other good things can feed the gut in addition to just fiber but fiber some forms of fiber or most forms of fiber will act as a prebiotic to some degree the undesirable effects is some prebiotics will cause a lot of uh, gas in some people. So, for example, inulin, uh, which you'll find in chicory, it's also an additive in a lot of probiotics. Uh, things like FOS, uh, fructooligosaccharides, are often used as a prebiotic. Uh, I tend not to give probiotics that contain them because they can be so gas forming uh, for people that uh, it causes kind of a lot of discomfort for the patients and they're not necessarily going to continue taking them okay uh demulsants so that medicinal action a demulsant is a substance that 
helps protect mucous membranes. And you use herbs that have a demulsive property uh, for treating things like heartburn, stomach ulcers, any kind of inflammation uh, of the mucous membrane. So mostly gastrointestinal, but they can also exert an effect on the respiratory and the urinary tract as well, okay? Um, although in those cases, uh, it's not that the fiber you consume orally directly ends up in the urinary tract or in the respiratory tract. Um, some demulsants work by other mechanisms we'll talk about later to exert an indirect effect, maybe stimulating production of mucus or whatever it is, but some of them will directly coat the uh, esophagus and the stomach to exert their effect there. Another important property of carbohydrates is they can act as a bulk laxative. Now, not all carbohydrates don't do this. If you eat a whole bunch of sugar, uh, it may promote a bowel movements, but not by a bulk laxative. So if you if you ever notice that kids who eat a lot of Halloween candy, they'll get a lot of farting, a lot of gas, flatulence, and then uh, they often will get loose stools and diarrhea. Certainly, I've seen that with my own children. Uh, if they eat a whole bunch of sugar, they'll have loose stools because they can't absorb all the sugar in some cases. Um, and it'll get fermented in the gut, and some of it will pour more, pour, pour more water into the bowels, and it'll act as an osmotic laxative. At least that's what I think goes on if you have enough sugar. Um, so carbohydrates that are rich in fibers, soluble fiber, uh, and also insoluble fibers will have a bulking action. So if you've ever heard of something like metamucil or psyllium, when you add water to it, it absorbs the water and expands in the bowel. And by expanding in the bowel, it forms a bulking action and that stimulates stretch, stretch receptors that gets paralysis to have. I'll say that again at some point. Uh, you don't need to know that for just yet for the exam, but you will need to know that for the final, okay? Um, fiber also exerts a hypoglycemic action, and the way that it does that is when you uh, take soluble fiber, it turns into jello or like slime in your, in your intestinal tract, and why that's good is, imagine if you're in a swimming pool, swimming along, moving at a good clip. If someone fills the swimming pool up with jello, you're going to slow right down and you're not going to move as quickly through the water, right? And that's what happens when you have a lot of fiber uh, in your intestinal tract is it slows sugar molecules that are swimming through the intestinal tract. And so as a result, you don't get that rapid spike. And that alone, just by increasing fiber in the diet, uh, will reduce those major spikes in blood sugar which cause the release of insulin, and then insulin leads to fat production and wears out, causes inflammatory things, all sorts of other things that are not good. Um, and so by, instead of having a rapid spike, you kind of help to moderate it. It's not unlike having a shot of tequila on an empty stomach versus on a full stomach. You know what I mean? If you have a full stomach, it hits you, but not to the same degree. You know, you won't kind of get all boom, boom, okay? Or beer or wine or whatever you want to whatever kind of alcohol it is, okay? And that's one of the reasons why I tell people, even if they're eating fruit, never have fruit alone. I always combine it with, uh, ideally, uh, some nuts and seeds, uh, because the seeds often will have a lot of fiber to help balance the blood sugar, and then the nuts will have protein and fat and some fiber to help balance the blood sugar a little bit more. Because even, even fruit, which is good for you, can mess up your blood sugar uh, a little bit. Um, some other properties associated with, with um, uh, fiber is that it can lower cholesterol. Uh, at least, I mean, that's there's some debate on how much of the effect is related to cholesterol, maybe it's related to other things. But I think in general, a diet rich in fiber seems to lower cholesterol, but that tends to be a whole foods plant based diet, which also lowers cholesterol through other mechanisms. So, but for the cardiovascular system, there's probably some benefits. As an aside, supplementing with psyllium or uh, fiber in general is never going to be as good as eating a diet that's rich in those things, but it might be indicated for some things. And finally, some carbohydrates um, exert an influence on the immune system, and there are specific types of carbohydrates that have little, the way the carbohydrates are arranged can actually bind to certain white blood cells and trigger some kind of immune response or modulate an immune response. 
Um, and I'll give you some examples in a second. Okay. Um, I don't know what analogy Jessica's saying, but thank you, Jessica. So glycoside. So, um, sorry about the reception in the background. Tamara gets, she brings me coffee, and, which is amazing, and she gets a little excitable out there and gets loud on the computer here and the telephone's ringing. But um, that's just how life is at the clinic. Uh, okay, glycosides. So one of the things with glycosides I want to emphasize is that the medicinal action of glycosides, you can't create a summary or any kind of uh, generalization on what glycosides do. Because there are a, a million different form, types of glycosides. There's a million compounds that are classified as glycosides. So almost everything can be considered a glycoside. So uh, potentially, I mean, not everything, but almost everything. Um, so it's not really a good way to, to classify. Now you can classify the subcategories of glycosides can exert an effect. I'll go through some of those examples. So what a glycoside is, is it's basically some kind of molecule, often, if not always, but often it's a phenolic compound that has a sugar molecule attached to it, okay? So in this little picture, this little you know, frog-like structure, if you don't remember from biochemistry, that's a, that's a sugar molecule, glucose molecule. And it's attached onto this O H group, this O group here, this is uh, normally an OH group, on this phenolic compound. Now, if you know anything from chemistry, this is a reversible reaction. So you can add and remove sugar molecules onto a phenol compound relatively easily. And through the process of hydrolysis, and hydrolysis uh, uses the water molecule, often in the presence of an enzyme, but it can also be with high temperature because it's a relatively unstable bond, or with a lot of acid or with a lot of base, that sugar molecule will get removed and liberate uh, the compound. So the glycoside is referred to the molecule with the sugar attached. When you learn about stuff, if you see, and I'm gonna give you some little hints as we go through it. So whenever there's an A stuck in, well, often when there's an A stuck in front of a, a chemical term or a, a, some other term, uh, it means not. So a glycone means not the glycone. Amenorrhea means not menstruating. Uh, those are just two that popped into my mind. Okay, so there's one's a medical condition, the other one's a, a phytochemical. So, um, so in this case, salicin is a glycoside molecule of salicylic acid. Remember, salicylic acid is the main anti-inflammatory compound that was extracted from willow bark. But you'll find salicylic acid in lots of fruits and vegetables. So when you eat a whole foods based, whole foods plant based diet. You are consuming almost, I mean, literally low levels of kind of quote unquote natural aspirin on a daily basis, you know, and that'll exert some blood thinning effects. So, uh, so that's a good thing to have a little bit too much aspirin. No, but doctors don't recommend people take aspirin anymore regularly because of the risk of stomach ulcers. Um, and when you're getting it in your diet, small notes, it, there's other things that have a protective effect against stomach ulcers. So uh, you don't have to worry about getting a stomach ulcer from eating fruits and vegetables. Okay. So in this case, the glycoside has the sugar and this compound attached to it. The A-glycone means no sugar is the base compound that has the medicinal properties. And then glucose is just glucose, right? So in your body, enzymes will release this. Stomach acid will release this. Some gut bacteria will ferment it or remove this little sugar molecule as an energy source, liberating this compound as well. Okay. Um, so, an exam question I might say uh, which of the following is the glycone component uh, of found in the anti inflammatory compound in willow bark? Is it salicin? Is it salicylic acid? Or is it glucose? Now, I wouldn't put glucose, fructose, mannose. I wouldn't put different ones. I'm just, I don't care which sugar molecule it is. I just want you to know if everybody knows glucose is a sugar molecule. So that would be a fair question to ask, but I don't get too tricky with it. Okay. Um, 
So the reason why plants and animals add sugar molecules to these organic compounds is for several reasons. One, once you add a sugar molecule under this, under this salicylic acid molecule, it makes the structure more water soluble. So, you know, salicylic acid is somewhat water soluble, but it makes it more water soluble when there's a sugar molecule on it. And the advantage of that is it won't be able to uh, readily move across cell membranes. So salicylic acid can probably diffuse across cell membranes to some degrees because it's uh, somewhat antiphalic, uh, anti water soluble, fat soluble. Uh, but if you attach the sugar on, you can store it. You can put it in a little vesicles and, and it won't just, you know, wander around. It's kind of like tethering it. Um, it's like if you have like cows and you basically, um, you know, put a leash on it, so to speak. So it can't just wander around everywhere and cause, you know, problems. Because polystyric acid serves a purpose. I'm assuming when plants it has some uh, property against insects and bugs and, and, and bacteria and things like that, okay? So one, you make it more water soluble. Two, you're able to store it. Uh, three, another purpose for adding uh, sugar molecules onto things would be to, if you, if your the plant or your animal wanted to get rid of some substance in the body. And so in the case of estrogens, estrogen molecules and other hormones uh, have a few different ways that the liver will metabolize. And one of the processes, it'll add a sugar molecule called glucuronic acid onto the estrogen. And that'll help to excrete it because estrogen molecules are not very water soluble and they tend to diffuse through across cell membranes and end up going everywhere in the body. So if you're able to add a sugar molecule onto an estrogen or some other hormone molecule, it prevents the reabsorption uh, in the body, which is a good thing. Okay, so that way you can basically either pee it out or defecate it. Okay, so those are the main purposes of the glycosides. In this case, this particular glycoside has anti inflammatory properties. I'm pretty sure that the uh, anti inflammatory properties uh, occur when the thallus and the glycoside uh, gets that sugar molecule cleaved off. I think the salicylic acid is able to interact with the um, cyclooxygenase enzymes uh, in that free form, and I doubt it will be able to, to interact as well if at all uh, in the form of the salus and the glycoside. And so another reason why it's important is you temporarily and reversibly inactivate the compound so that it's not able to cause potentially harm or, or whatever, okay? Because um, you don't have that OH Often with phenolic compounds, the OH group is useful for interacting with things, okay? Now, other forms of glycosides that exist in nature are things like hydroquinone glycosides, cardiac glycosides, saponins, anthro uh, anthroquinone glycosides. I'll give you a few of the ideas behind this, okay? So, you guys probably heard of flavonoids. Bioflavonoids uh, and other flavonoids often exist as glycosides. And so you may have heard of one called uh, quercetin. Quercetin is available as a, as a supplement. And uh, I, I use it sometimes for people. It definitely has some, I think it has some benefits as an antihistamine for us. So I sometimes recommend people with allergies. Um, it also can have some blood pressure lowering effects. It has some, uh, maybe some calming effects. Uh, but quercetin's found lots of things, okay? So there, it's probably one of the more abundant uh, flavonoids in nature, but it, it often ex exists as a glycoside. And so the compound on the left is called rutin. Rutin is another phytochemical. But really when you get right down to it, all it is is quercetin with sugar molecules stuck on it. So you can see the little black compounds that are drawn. Those are the sugar molecules. And when you undergo hydrolysis, it liberates these sugar molecules and provides you with the a glycol, which in this case is quercetin, and the glycol molecule, which uh, I don't know what those two sugars are off the top of my head. I'm assuming it's two, two glucose molecules stuck together, but I, I learned it and forgot it a long time ago. Um, and the point of this is that some studies that I've read for on uh, colitis, for example, um, they found that quercetin had no benefit for colitis. But what they found is rutin as a supplement did seem to decrease inflammation, have some beneficial effects. 
And maybe one of the reasons for that is even though the active compound in both is quercetin, so either free quercetin or quercetin existing as a glycoside, it may be that adding the sugars also allowed that quercetin molecule to reach the bowels intact, where then the gut bacteria chewed off the sugars and liberated it so it could exert an influence there before it was altered by say there are other enzymes and stuff like that. I'm speculating, that's my opinion, but or what my thought. So it could be that uh, it can preserve these guys and prevent their degradation or their alteration. And certainly we know that your gut flora will have a significant, uh, will ferment phenolic compounds and, and alter them, okay? Um, so there you go. So there's another example of the glycoside. So anthropinone glycosides in this case, the drawing is too hard, to, it'd be too big to add all the sugars on this uh, for this slide, but intracritical glycosides, um, they are used as stimulating laxatives. Uh, coumarin is another glycoside, it's used for, uh, uh, well actually I don't know, it could have a few different things, it could be uh, used as for lymphatics, for a whole bunch of things, I don't know. Flavonoid glycoside, I showed you that one before. The phenol glycoside, that's just one of many different ones. Uh, another example, and that's also the flavonoid glycoside would be a subcategory of phenol glycosides. And then uh, a cyanogenic glycoside actually contains small amounts of cyanide, and this is found in uh, certain plants, like elder has cyan cyanogenic glycosides in it, uh, cherry bark does, uh, and certain foods, um, uh, root crops will do. We'll talk about those later on. So these are some categories. Cyanogenic glycosides tend to be toxic. Anything with cyanide and it's not really a great thing to have in your mouth. Okay. So we won't talk about the individual glycosides in any more detail now, but they'll come up later on just so you're not aware of. Okay. Next thing we want to talk about are uh, a group of fibers called mucilage, mucilage gums and gels. And they have Almost, I would say they have identical uh, medicinal actions, but they're classified slightly differently, okay? So if you hear of any of these, these functionally are in, interchangeably, but they have different sort of uh, classifications based on uh, a few different things we'll talk about in a second. So, mucilage and gum are rich in carbohydrate, and they're water soluble. And why that's important is when you add them to water, they basically dissolve in it and they turn into slime, okay? Um, or just, so slimy water is kind of like the initial sort of beginnings of it where it becomes nice and viscous. And then when you form gels, it becomes like a semi-solid substance like jello is, okay? Not all mucilaginous herbs will form gel, I don't think, or at least maybe it requires a really high amount of, uh, of it to do that. So marshmallow, which is shown on the left, uh, it will form that sort of gel-like slimy substance, but it requires a lot more of it compared to something like slippery elm or some other herbs, okay? So what gels are is gels can be mucilage and gums, and that's just more of the physical property it takes on where it forms that semi-solid-like structure, okay? So it tends to be, quote-unquote, non-liquid, even though a gel technically is liquid, you know? Um, now, the actions associated with this primarily is going to be a demulsant action, where it can basically coat your mucous membranes in your esophagus and in your intestinal tract and exert their effect there. Also, most gums and mucilage, because they're rich in fiber and form that slimy or gel-like substance, they're going to act as a bulk laxative. So herbs like psyllium, which is what makes up um, uh, metamucil, it will form a gel when you add it to water. So if you add too much metamucil or too much psyllium husk to water uh, and you have only a little bit of water in it, it'll form into like literally a block of lime that you may not be able to, to, to actually consume. And in fact, with psyllium, there's been FDA warnings of people choking on psyllium seed husk uh, after adding only a small amount uh, of water to a to a, maybe a spoonful of uh, psyllium, and it basically expands uh, and then gets stuck in the throat. So, um, so you have to watch it. So 
you know, carbohydrates can kill you in more than one. They can actually choke you to death if you consume too much of it and not enough water. And that's another reason why you want to have lots of water when you're taking in fiber uh, uh, in general. Also, in the food industry, gums and mucilage and gels are from the seaweeds or from various tree extracts or whatever it may be are often used as a thickening agent in soups, milkshakes, things like that. So carrageenan, which is uh, an extract from um, seaweed, which as an aside often irritates people who have got colitis, but anyways, uh, carrageenan uh, is a thickening agent. You'll find it some um, along food products, okay? And then finally, these gels and the gums and mucilage can be used um, as a, a hypoglycemic agent. So they can be used, maybe supplement with some fiber with a meal, can help with weight loss, or can help balance blood sugar and stuff like that, okay? Uh, so, what's mucilage? How is it defined? Mucilage is a physiological product produced under normal conditions, okay? So, this basically means that the plant just grows and it produces this mucilage all the time. Um, and so, if you take something like marshmallow leaf or the flowers and you basically pop them in your mouth and start chewing on it, it's It'll form like a little bit of a slimy texture to it, okay? Or you take flax seeds and you grind them up and add them to water, you'll get that nice mucilage extracted. So you can find it in seeds and roots and leaf and bark, um, and the plant produces it all the time, okay? So I eat flax seeds chia daily, and so I'm getting my source of mucilage and soluble fiber in that form. Some people supplement with psyllium. Which you can do, I'd rather have you eat flax and chia, because the advantage of eating flax and chia is you get all the phenolic compounds and the omega-3s along with it, and not just the fiber, okay? So, uh, rarely, rarely do I need people to supplement, supplement with fiber, um, if they're not getting able to get in the diet. Certain roots, like marshmallow root, uh, can be used fully, but you can get it from the leaf and the flowers as well. Aloe vera leaf contains... Uh, uh, a type of mucilage or a gel that actually forms a gel eventually. And then finally, slippery elm bark. If you take the elm tree, uh, uh, almost rubra, which is uh, slippery elm, uh, if you take the branches and you scrape off the inner lining of the bark, it has a nice powder that can be made into a porridge like consistency and eaten as, as like a nutritive food, or it can be consumed uh, in small amounts in water to help treat things like heartburn. So, marshmallow and slippery elm are often. Uh, used as herbal remedies for things like heartburn or other types of inflammatory issues of the um, gastrointestinal tract. So psyllium, this is one of the plants photographs of what psyllium looks like. So the seeds that this produces uh, are often consumed. And flax seeds, I think most people have seen what flax seed looks like. That's a pretty low flower as well. Um, but the flower is not used, it's, used, it's a seed that's used, okay? Now, gums are a little bit different in the fact that they are produced when the plant is subjected to some kind of trauma. So, um, when you take certain trees, like one of the original uh, gums that uh, people have heard about her is like chiclet gum. So, chiclet gum was basically extracted from the chiclet tree that grows in Central America. I photographed this down in Mexico. Um, there was an example of the tree there when when you put an incision in the side of the tree, and I did that uh, small incision there, you can see that white liquid that comes out basically is rich in gum. And so in this case, under certain conditions, it produces more of this gum. And so because I've traumatized the tree, it releases this, and then this um, can be collected and then used for whatever purpose. So lots of trees can produce gum. So Mastic gum is from an island in Greece. Uh, it's used by locals for some digestive problems. It's also chewed as a chewing gum. When I was in Greece, I saw they were selling it as a master gum. And then it has, in addition to the gum, it also has some essential oils, almost like a pine uh, sap sort of taste to it. Uh, guar gum, xanthan gum, arabic gum are also used in the cooking in, uh, uh, food industry as a thickening agent. Um, 
Most of these I don't use in herbal medicine. Master gum, you can, it's just very expensive. Um, so if I was in Greece, I would, where I had access to it and it wasn't expensive, but it's not really on my top list. There's a few commercially available natural products that have it in it, but I don't tend to use it. Um, also, if you ever make bubbles, so if you're a parent and you make some bubbles for your kids, um, the way they get those really big bubbles, you know, those ones where you see like two foot bubbles, the way you can make those at home is by taking, has to be uh, Dawn soap. I don't know why, but Dawn soap is just awesome for making bubbles with. And you combine it with some mucilage. So it could be any one of these gums, Master Gum or, or Guar Gum. Um, I think I used it with that. Um, and a little glycerol as well, which, uh, or glycerin or glycerol. And, but you could just use the bar gum and, and the Dawn soap and there's lots of recipes you can get online. That uh, kind of the gum, the carbohydrate components helps maintain the surface tension of the bubbles. So you can get really big bubbles, which you know kids love and adults too. Who doesn't love bubbles? So, uh, so that's another way you can use gum. So you can buy, um, most of these gums you can buy at uh, grocery stores or bulk barn. You can purchase these. And use them as picking agents. If you want to make some bubbles for your kids, you can get them too. Okay. Uh, so Ben's asking about the fat. In this case, uh, I don't. I don't know what if tree sap. See, the thing with tree sap, I. I think it's a different classification uh, than the gums, but I, maybe it's related. I, I don't want to, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, three sap, I usually think of uh, being slightly different. Usually, like pine tree sap, for example, is more resinous. Uh, it may contain some car carbohydrates, but it's usually a bit more resinous where it contains uh, non polar compounds in it. But you can have, I mean, there's an overlap because tree sap can contain gum and resins. And we'll talk about those in a second, okay? Uh, Beta-glucans are another group of carbohydrates that um, are technically a fiber. But what's interesting about these is the arrangement of the carbohydrates. Not only can they form uh, an active mucilage potential, but some of these will actually exert an immunostimulating effect. And so when you get the linkage, for example, beta-1,3, beta-1,4 linkages is what you're going to find in barley and oats. And that's what gives oatmeal, or one of the things that gives oatmeal and barley soup and stuff, that viscous, thick, sort of slimy consistency, okay? Now, beta-1,3, 1,4 linkages refers to how these carbohydrates are stuck together, which oxygen molecule and the sugar molecule is it stuck to uh, and how it's linked onto the next one. Now, the beta-1,3, 1, 1,4 linkage it forms slimy water, but it doesn't have a major immunostimulating action, okay? It helps to lower cholesterol, has some other beneficial effects, but it doesn't have a strong immunostimulating effect. I don't want to say it doesn't have any, because I bet you it might have a little bit, but I don't think it has a significant one. Now, when you get into the medicinal mushrooms, shiitake, ganoderma, uh, orishi, uh, uh, Coriolis versicolor, which is, uh, or Trimides versicolor, uh, which is also called turkey tail. They are all used in herbal medicine as immunostimulants, antivirals, anti-cancer things, uh, herbs, because the beta-1,3 and 1,6 linkage, not 1,4 linkage, actually uh, somehow interacts with the immune system to uh, have an immunostimulant and immunomodulating effect and thereby indirectly having an antiviral and anti-cancer effects. So their anti-cancer and antiviral effects is more because they stimulate certain immune cells that then go and eat the viruses and eat the cancer. So a lot of natural treatment protocols for treating cancer will include giving some kind of medicinal mushroom uh, as part of it. And these can also, shiitake mushrooms are often eaten in uh, Japanese cuisine and, and mushrooms in general are eaten in, um, um, in Asian cuisine and also North American, North American cuisine. Um, so I think the take home here is that 
beta linkages and beta glucans can help with cholesterol and can uh, have positive effects that are associated with with eating more fiber in general. But it appears that only the one three one six linkages exert that effect on the immune system. Um, and then remember I mentioned carrageenan later earlier on, which was used as a uh, uh, thickening agent. It also has a beta linkage, but it has alpha one three beta one four linkage on the exam. The only exam question I might ask is I want you to remember beta one three one six linkage. So the other linkages I don't care about, uh, but I might ask you which of the following linkages exert an immunostimulating effect. And is it one three one four one three one six one three one one five or whatever it may be? And that could be a question. I might also say which of the following plants uh, has a beta one three one six language? Is it a shiitake mushrooms? Is it b marshmallow? Is it c? So that would be another thing I might ask for questions. Uh, so it appears when it comes to oats, just as an aside, is that some of the cholesterol lowering effects associated with oatmeal is associated to the actual fiber content. So the more viscous the fiber, the more slimy and thicker it is, the greater effect it has on LDL cholesterol. Now, in the case of oatmeals, just as an aside, oatmeal also has some important phenolic compounds that exert a positive effect on the cardiovascular system. So I don't think it's only beta-glucans. I think it's beta-glucans and some of the phenolic compounds in oatmeal. So oatmeal is good. The only thing I don't like about oatmeal is if you're only only eating oatmeal for breakfast, it is only carbohydrates. So you're not getting any proteins or fats with it. Um, and I don't think you have to go overboard with protein and fats, but you certainly will. Uh, I think it's better to throw in some uh, flax or chia or a handful of walnuts in with this if you're going to be eating oatmeal for breakfast, not to have it just on its own. Okay. So this is a Rishi mushroom, Ganoderma lucidium. Uh, I grew this myself. I bought one of these online little kits on how to grow mushrooms. And it's fine. You stick the brick of sawdust in water, uh, keep it closed up in high humidity, and then weeks later, this beautiful mushroom emerges. And I love this mushroom. It's got a kick-ass name called the Mushroom of Immortality. Um, like, if I was a mushroom, I want that name. And the reason why it has that name is it's believed that uh, it helps make people live longer and it's used for cancer, it's used for heart disease. Now the medicinal properties of reishi mushroom is partly related to the beta glucans that it has and that's how you get some of its immunostimulating, immunomodulating effects. But in addition to that, it also has other compounds that are really important including triterpenoids that are also found in herbs like ginseng for example. So, um, so the benefits of reishi mushroom definitely is linked to the beta glucans, but there are other things in it that are also important as well. Okay, and you can find these uh, on sale. And actually, there's like a, a bit of there was a trend going at one point where people were eating reishi mushroom with their coffee in the morning. Uh, there's lots of supplements. You go into Chinatown, there's always a lot of reishi mushrooms uh, down there. It doesn't grow. This Ganoderma lucidum doesn't grow in North America and under normal conditions. There is a variety called Ganoderma suga, which grows on hemlock trees in Canada, which has been used. There is some research showing benefit, uh, and you'll find, I found it, found it a bunch of times up, up in Algonquin Park, um, but it doesn't have the same history of use as the Rishi mushroom does. So, uh, there you go. So, shiitake mushroom, reishi mushroom, turkey kale, these are all the main ones that are often used as medicinal mushrooms. There are other ones as well. Uh, uh, some agaric species like the button mushroom you eat. Uh, I would imagine it probably has some health, has some uh, beta glucans that have immunostimulating effects as well. But these are the main ones that are often sold commercially in supplement forms or you make it as a tea. Turkey tail, different uh, um, species of this grow around. I think I took a photograph of this in my backyard up at my cottage. Um, I believe this is Trimedes versicolor. Um, there could be another species that looks like it, but it looks an awful lot like it. And it tends to grow in the Northern Hemisphere. Rishi tends to grow in the tropics. So I've seen it growing in Costa Rica um, and in Asia as well. Now there's another thing that's worth mentioning that 
There's a specific extract that they did a lot of research studies on that are published in PubMed, and it's called polysaccharide K or PSK. And there are some supplement companies that sell this extract, and it's from turkey tail, and it's a proteoglycan. What that means is you've got the beta glucan with that one, uh, with that uh, beta six uh, linkage to it, but in addition to that, you have the um, little amino acids that are attached, or a little uh, oligosaccharides that are attached to it. That that combination exerts additional amino stimulating effects. So. I don't know if it's superior because a lot of the stuff you don't, there isn't a lot of research comparing that I know of comparing a bunch of cancer people taking shiitake, some taking reishi and some turkey taking turkey tail and who does the best with it. Like I have no idea. There's probably some subtle differences, but the research doesn't, it's just not, you know, there's not that much difference. And, and the other thing is if you were to take two capsules of shiitake, two capsules of reishi and two turkey, capsules of turkey tail, uh, would it be overkill? You know, is it kind of, are they all working by a similar mechanism? You know, don't know enough. I've given these to cancer patients. Do they work? I think so. Certainly the research suggests they do. Um, whether or not uh, extends your life by however many years or improves symptoms of fatigue, it's, you know, it's hard to say. So that's the carbohydrates we've covered. I think most of the carbides are going to come up a couple more times in a second, but there's a start. Now, do you guys have any questions before we take a break? So Ben's saying you guys have got the hemlock reishi down in, I think that's Vermont, isn't it? Um, and that makes sense because it's all, Vermont's very similar to, I mean, we're on similar kind of band of, Force, right? So, um, oh, Virginia. <laughs> you can tell I don't have a clue because I'm not from the US. Um, sorry about that. Um, okay, if you guys have any questions? If not, let's come back in 10 minutes, 10.55. We'll be back and we will continue with the resins, okay?
I'm just going to check and see how many more slides I got to get through. A bunch. Okay. So moving on, we talked about the carbohydrates. Now we're going to move on to resins. Okay. So what resins are is that basically they're a mixture of hydrocarbons, and a hydrocarbon is a compound that contains primarily carbons and hydrogens but there could be some oxygens in there as well okay and these resins tend to be excreted from plants uh, pure resins are usually considered non-polar meaning they're not very soluble in water um, and often i usually think of them coming from more trees but you can also get them from i mean trees and shrubs but there are also some plants lots of plants will create excrete some resins as well and, and give it like a, a sticky substance for example like uh, marijuana plants the flower produces the resin and they're very sticky substance on the, on the flowers that produces contains the thc and some other essential oils okay so uh, generally speaking when it comes to phytochemicals and the different colors for them the color is dependent on um uh, how many conjugated double bonds they have in a row and you need to have a certain number of these conjugated double bonds at a certain length in order to absorb specific wavelengths of light so most resins are colorless they don't absorb and reflect lights in the visible spectrum so they tend to be clear or need to have a bit of a yellowy brown sort of consistent color to it so the resins often contain various phytochemicals like terpenoids we'll talk about later on and these are larger compounds and when resins contain smaller terpenoids or other uh, uh, compounds that are volatile then it would be called classified as an allele resins and i would say that most of the, or a lot of the resins that exist exist as oleo resins where there's essential oils along with the other larger non-polar compounds in it and it's common that they're associated with a carbohydrate group as well. So if it contains carbohydrates in, that are classified as gums and you've got a gum resin, and then you can have oleo gum resins where they've got some of the larger nonpolar compounds, some smaller volatile ones, and also um, the gum in there as well. Now, sometimes people will just call it like that tree sap like a resin that's coming out of it. Um, there's also, um, when you go back to the chiclet gum that's obtained from a tree, it's probably more likely to be classified like accurately as a gum resin or as an allele gum resin because it does have some volatile oils. It may have mostly mucilage in it, so mostly the gum in it, but it does have some essential oils in it as well. Now, generally speaking, plants release these resins and gum resins um to protect the tree from animals eating it or insects eating it and additionally a lot of these resins will have some antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory properties in general so balsam resin so that's uh christmas tree uh, a lot of christmas trees are from uh, balsam trees and balsam resin has long been used as a uh, remedy for respiratory tracts um, uh, primarily, and that's one of the indications it's, in, it's found in some extractions and consumed in that form. Okay. Um, now, just as an aside, you may have heard of synthetic resins, uh, like epoxy resins, and those um, have no uh, relationship to the resins that we're talking about uh, when it comes to phytochemicals. Okay. So here's some resins that are quite pretty. So you may have heard of two of these anyways, or almost maybe heard a little bit of the third one. Um, so these are commercially, on the left-hand side we have myrrh. And myrrh comes uh, from a resinous tree in North Africa that grows in like an arid place. It's been, uh, the myrrh has been 
considered a very valuable substance from the beginning of time. Remember when, if anyone's heard the story about baby Jesus getting gifts, he got gold, he got frankincense, and he got myrrh, okay? And myrrh is used as an incense, and it's burned for that smell, but it's also used uh, uh, as an antimicrobial and as a preservative. The ancient Egyptians used to use myrrh as an embalming agent, so um, before they're preparing the uh, uh, the mummies, they would basically preserve them with myrrh. And now the way that I got this photograph, normally when you buy it, you actually buy a little, it's almost like, it looks like little rocks of myrrh. Um, and usually they kind of have like a, a brown, they just look kind of look like little, well, kind of look like feces actually, it looks little brown balls. But if you, like I rinsed it off with some rubbing alcohol and I backlit it when I took the photograph, you see it actually has kind of a pretty little color to it. Now, when you move on to the next one, you've got a picture of amber there. Now what amber is, is amber is basically ancient resin from trees dating back, you know, could be dating back, you know, to the dinosaur times. And um, you can buy some really interesting resin, uh, or sorry, amber that often will have like little insects in it. Uh, some of them are quite valuable that will actually have like a, like a little lizard or something preserved in it. And when it's polished up, it, it takes on like a glass-like appearance and it's quite pretty. Um, and amber has been used um, in medicine as well. Um, and again, it's just basically petrified myrrh uh, or frankincense or some other type of substance like that. And then finally, the picture on the right is Indian frankincense. Indian frankincense, uh, Boswell is right. It's different than the frankincense that baby Jesus got. It's one that grows in kind of the West uh, India area, up in sort of around, I think around the arid region, up around Punjab region. Um, and uh, it's used as an anti-inflammatory substance primarily, uh, and it would be used as a as a uh, uh, antiseptic or antimicrobial as well. So those are some classic examples. You would need to use a tincture, which is an alcohol extract with a relatively high amount of alcohol in order to extract uh, the active ingredient uh, that you're looking for. Tea would be uh, unable to dissolve the active ingredient. If you, if you boil it in water for a long period of time, I assume eventually the, uh, the resins would kind of uh, break apart so it wouldn't hold that form, but none of them would go into water, okay? The gum may go into water, but not the actual resinous substance, okay? So these would be uh, containing primarily hydrocarbons, uh, and there could be some gum mixed in with these guys as well, okay? Now, when you have an oleoresin, which a lot of these guys are, and you subject it to steam distillation, you apply heat to it and capture the heat and the steam and then separate the water from the resin, that's where you often will get essential oils. So that's how you can get essential oils. And you can do this with ole oleoresins or you can do it to uh, other things. And so when you take something like uh, pine sap and heat it up and you collect the steam that comes off of it and you uh, separate the aqueous component, which is the water, you get basically turpentine. And so turpentine uh, is a solvent um, used for as a paint thinner, uh, but it's also some turpentine is often found in herbal preparation, both internally and topically. Small amounts won't kill you, but if you, but I think everyone can appreciate, you don't want to drink a glass of turpentine, it just wouldn't be good for you. And so um, that's what turpentines contain. And they contain what are primarily called monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes. Now, once you've collected the essential oils, the substance that's remaining afterwards is called a rosin, okay? And rosins are going to have heavier compounds. So they're primarily going to be diterpenoids and triterpenoids. Uh, we'll discuss, you'll, these terms are going to come up again later on. So once you reread the notes on your own, some of this will make more sense. And that's a very, rosin is a sticky substance obtained from resin that um, commercially it's available uh, for gymnasts will, and rock climbers will put it on their hands in a dust form to make their hands stickier, okay? Uh, it's applied to violin bows to make the, uh, the strings grip more to the, uh, 
uh, or the bow strings to grip to the actual violin uh, strings. And so that's just where those things, those terms come from. So appreciate turpentine is primarily makes, made of uh, alpha pinene uh, from pine trees. And you get alpha pinene in lots of herbal products, including things like rosemary that people eat. So small amounts of these things aren't bad for you, okay? Large amounts would be. Now oils. So we talked about resins, and oils can include some, or resins can include some oils, okay? The first one we're gonna talk about are essential oils. So you could call, that, call these essential oils, volatile oils, aromatic oils, all the same thing. And these, the way they're classified is generally speaking, small molecules have the potential to evaporate, especially if they're non-polar. Now, when you add little oxygen molecules to any of these substances, they tend to get a little heavier and they're more likely to, to wanna like, uh, they'll form like little magnetic like bonds to water. So they're less likely to evap evaporate. More force will be required, more energy will be required to evaporate them. Um, and so most of the essential oils usually have between zero and two oxygens added on to it. Not usually any more than that, I think, okay? And generally speaking, they tend to consist of about 10 to 15 carbons in length. And that seems to be the area where most essential oils are. So menthol, which is from peppermint oil, it has about 15, um, sorry, 10, about 10 carbons in that. Okay, uh, one oxygen, 10 carbons. Eucalyptol, which is one of the main uh, essential oils in eucalyptus oil, uh, is about 10. Cinnamon oil contains cinnamon aldehyde, which is 10 carbons, actually it's nine carbons, I think. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine carbons, and then uh, one oxygen on there. Anethol's got 10 carbons, um, and it's the licorice, like tasting substance in fennel and anise as well. So they mainly, essential oils can contain monoterpenes and often sesquiterpenes as well. And also another group of compounds called phenylpropenes that we'll talk about next week, okay? We should get to the monoterpenes today. In general, I would say all essential oils potentially, you know, I'm reluctant to say all, but I'm going to be bold and say all essential oils have a carminative action associated with it. And carminatives are used to relax smooth muscles in the intestinal tract, to aid digestion, to increase circulation to the intestinal tract, and to relax sphincters, the little muscular bands that separate like the intestine, small intestine from the large intestine or the esophagus to the stomach. And so the main indication for carminative uh, containing herbs are. Um, for aiding in digestion and bloating and gas, okay? Another thing they do is they act as a rubifacient. Ruba means red in Latin. So a rubifacient is a substance that makes the skin red. So when you apply essential oils topically, they tend to cause the capillaries to dilate, and presumably this is also occurring inside when you eat essential oils at some level. And by doing that, you increase circulation to the area, and rubifacients are applied topically in a lot of muscle creams like uh, well, the commercially available muscle creams that have that uh, menthol camphor like smell to it, okay? Um, and so they're used as a rubification or a counter irritant as a muscle cream. Uh, many of them have antiseptic properties. So most essential oils uh, disrupt cell membranes and can be used to uh, treat viral and bacterial infections. Uh, and many of them are often taken internally or applied topically or inhaled with steam inhalation to help people cough up phlegm as an expectorant, okay? There are other actions, but those are some big ones. Now, with regards to plant families, there's a number of plant families that are rich in essential oils. And when I hear of a plant, uh, of a herb that belongs to the APACA family, uh, that's another, another term for umbiliferate family, that's the carrot family. That's uh, a lot of the culinary seeds you have, like celery, um, uh, uh, coriander, fennel, anise, uh, caraway, cumin, all those little seeds are rich in essential oils, and they're all used for digestive issues. And some of them have other specific indications, uh, 
but in general, those culinary spices you can find in your in your uh, spice store, um, they're designed to be eaten uh, in herbal medicine to help to aid with digestion. Okay. Another important plant family is the mint family. So this contains things like peppermint, spearmint, thyme, oregano, marjoram, uh, basil, lavender. All those are rich in essential oils and are often used as digestive aids, but they have other indications as well. Some other maybe families you may not have heard of is like the laurel family. Now, what's interesting about the laurel family is most of the plants in this family uh, are also very aromatic. So if you take leaves from a cinnamon or camphor tree and you crush them up in your hand and smell it, it has that nice, beautiful aromatic smell. So again, more spices come from this, including sassafras and um, uh, the myrtle family, myrtaceae family, contains clove, eucalyptus, tea tree, okay? So other members of these families, a lot of the medicinal properties associated with these herbs is related to the essential oils. It can be like cinnamon also has uh, other phytochemicals that exert some therapeutic effects, but the essential oils are definitely going to be a component of it, okay? And appreciate if you take, for example, uh, clove, the spice, if you eat five grams of clove, the spice, the whole plant, it's going to be pretty intense, but you probably won't die from it. If you take five grams of clove, the or five mils of clove, the essential oil, it's dangerous. It can cause death in people. And so essential oils are very concentrated, and you don't need to use as much of the essential oil as a tea. So you might drink a cup of peppermint tea, but you would never drink a cup of peppermint essential oil, right? Because you'd be literally drinking turpentine, you know, well, almost literally. I mean, it's turpentine and life. It's a little bit different. So um, remember, because we're not really designed to be consuming large amount of non-polar compounds. It's going to disrupt our cell membranes. Uh, small amounts will have a slightly irritating effect, and then high amounts will just literally burn everything, okay? So uh, not to mention with some of these um, herbs, uh, not only does just the essential oil irritating, but they can have a specific structure that's metabolized by the liver that can have toxic effects to the liver and kidney as well. Um, so someone that uh, Ben's asking this grinding the seeds uh, changes efficacy. Anytime you take a whole thing and you grind it up, you're going to make it more, you're going to be uh, increasing the surface area, which releases those compounds to a greater, at a greater speed. And so uh, eating the seeds whole, you may not get all of the essential oils being released versus uh, grinding it up and taking it in the powder form. Also, if you're storing, let's say, um, spices in your cabinet, if you had a powder, those volatile oils are more likely to be released from a powder than if it's in a whole seed. And um, another thing I'll mention is that essential oils, the boiling point is usually around 300 and some degrees Celsius. It varies depending on how big they are and how many oxygens and a few other things. Um, so, you know, even though your house may only be at 30 degrees, these things slowly evaporate over time. They'll last for quite a while, um, but they do evaporate uh, at room temperature. Depends on the humidity and pressure and all these other factors, but um, but they are slowly being released into the environment, and that's why um, when you cook with them, you can smell them. And that's what, you know, if you take a, make a cup of peppermint tea, uh, you can smell the peppermint. If you boil the peppermint on your uh, stove for two hours, uh, the peppermint tea, eventually all the volatile components will evaporate off and the house smells nice, but the tea itself will probably taste bitter and, and void of that nice aromatic oil. Okay. Um, Is there anything else I want to say on essential oils? So treat these with respect. If you have them at home, do not let your children have access to them. Um, we have them at home and they are on the highest shelf in our kitchen because 
I know my kids will move a chair over and start playing with them, you know. And, um, you know, if they got into a tincture, you know, and they had a teaspoon of tincture, probably not the end of the world. If they had a teaspoon of clove oil, which I don't even think I have in the house, but um, it would kill them. Um, one other thing I'll mention is just as an aside, if you get those you're really irritating pantry moths, you know, if you sometimes you pick them up at bulk barn and they come home and they fly around your house and they're hard to get rid of. Uh, we got, we haven't had any for a while, but we just got a bunch. And what my wife does or did, I guess I did it too, but she did it most recently, is um, we just take a, some kind of cloth and just saturate it with, well, maybe add a half a teaspoon of essential oils to it or a quarter teaspoon. I don't know how many she drops she put on it. And then place it in the pantry. And moths don't like the smell of essential oils. And that's why in the old days, cedar chests were used to preserve valuable clothing because the essential oils of the cedar would repel and discourage moths from going in there. And so if you just add a whole bunch of essential oils to your cupboard where you keep your grains and other things that the uh, uh, moths like, it'll just bug them and they'll fly out. So we did this and then, you know, there was... A couple of days where a few of the moths we saw them come out after we did that because we're basically flushing them out. Uh, flushing or flushing? It's flushing. Um, killed those guys and now it seems like things are good. So it's a good way to, if you've got pantry moths, just get some essential oils in there and make your house smell really nice. You can use cinnamon or whatever. Uh, it's a very pleasant smell. Are right, infusing essential oils safe for kids? Uh, it's all dose dependent. Everything's safe within, you know, you know a few little. Some drops in their bedrooms, totally is safe. Uh, certainly if my kids have a respiratory tract infection, I'll throw some essential oils in the room and just let them inhale them. Uh, sometimes I'll throw a few squirts of uh, lavender in the rooms just to help them fall asleep, but more for my sake than for theirs. Uh, 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 and then Heather's saying, I've seen a big trend of people consuming essential oils on a regular basis. Is this dangerous to do? Um, I think it's potentially dangerous. Um, I don't see any reason, like if you're having small amounts of essential oils through your diet, because you're cooking with a lot of spices, I think that's good for you. And so if the amount of essential oils you're consuming is comparable to that, you're, I doubt there would be any concern with that. The problem is, as we talk about with the safety, safety lecture is that there are certain essential oils that are actually not very safe. Some of them are. So I would say, you know, I don't think there's any benefit to taking oregano oil on a daily basis. Yes, it acts as a as a uh, antioxidant, but it's not really. The, there's so many other better antioxidants to take that I wouldn't be consuming it. If I had a respiratory tract infection, I would maybe do some steam inhalation with it, maybe take a few drops. If I wanted to treat a uh, uh, some kind of infection where I was thinking they, the bug may have produced a biofilm, I would use it. But I think. Um, I think research is somewhat limited on the efficacy and there is some potential harm, but it's not, it's not like, I don't think they're being the average person having a few drops of essential oils. I don't think it's a bad thing, but I wouldn't do, I don't do it personally. Okay. So I think there is harm that can occur because they do get processed by your liver and your kidneys. And so if your liver was already somewhat compromised or you're taking, let's say cinnamon oil, uh, daily, that could actually lead to uh, drug-induced hepatitis. So some, yes, it would be harmful. Other ones, peppermint oil, probably not. Okay, probably not. Looks like I think peppermint oil is pretty safe, but other ones are more toxic. Okay. So those are the aromatic or essential or volatile oils. Fixed oils are different. These are large nonpolar compounds that consists primarily of a triglyceride backbone with fatty acids attached to it. And those fatty acids could be a saturated fat, uh, a monounsaturated fat, like those found in olive oil, or a polyunsaturated fat, like the omega-3s or the omega-6s that are found in things like flax and chia and other seeds. Okay? Um, in general, I would say one of the most toxic one of the reasons why I think there's been a rise in heart disease, you know, people were trying to blame cholesterol over the years. That's debatable. One of the worst things is one, trans fats, which are not natural. And then two, uh, 
vegetable oils in general. So corn, canola, cotton seed, sunflower seed. So those are all really high in omega-6s, which have a pro-inflammatory effect. And when you cook them, they're unstable and then they degrade and form really unhealthy things. Okay. So a whole foods plant-based diet is not cooking with omega-6 rich oils. And so here would be an example where if you're eating French fries, uh, you're a vegan who eats French fries all the time and you use a lot of vegetable oil, uh, it might be worse for you than using animal products for that matter. You know, um, now if you're eating corn fed beef, then you're not only are you getting all the negative things associated with the fat and you're getting some saturated fat, but you're also getting, uh, uh, sorry, corn fed beef, you're eating that, you're not just getting the protein that's different than animal uh, vegetable protein, but you're also getting uh, omega 6s in the fats because basically the bio 6s that are fed to the, or the, uh, uh, the omega 6s that are fed to the cow are basically going to be end up in the fat, making their fat all marbled and, and uh, which is desirable from a taste but bad from a health standpoint. standpoint. So I think flaxseed is healthy, but you never cook with it because it's polyunsaturated. Coconut oil you can cook with, it's a, it's a medium chain fatty acid. Uh, it's a saturated fat, doesn't seem to have a negative effect on heart disease, doesn't have a positive effect, doesn't have a negative effect. Castor oil, you don't want to cook with that, that stuff will give you diarrhea. Um, it's a great laxative, but I don't tend to use it. Olive oil tends to be the main cooking oil that I use, that and avocado oil. Uh, almond oil, I, I don't really use a lot of, I eat almonds and walnuts. So some, some nuts and seeds, like sunflower seeds may be good for you, but not eating a lot of the oil, the oil would be bad for you, okay? Um, and that's more going to be hopefully be covering nutrition for you guys. The take home here is fixed oils. We use them in herbal medicine. Castor oil would be the one herb uh, that is not used in nutrition at all, exclusively for herbal medicine. And then olive oil, coconut oil, flaxseed oil, uh, those could be used in talk about nutrition and also talk about herbal medicine because there's an overlap there, okay? Now, wax. So, wax is an interesting substance. Um, wax is kind of like a fat, but it's not. So what it basically has is you don't have that glycerol backbone, okay? And the glycerol backbone has three carbons and three OHs. What you have is you basically have a long, hydrocarbon chain with an OH group attached to it. So it's a super, super long alcohol essential. So ethanol is like two carbons and an OH group. These waxes will have much longer. It could be, I don't know, 12 or 18 carbons in length with an OH. And then that OH attaches to um, a fatty, fatty acid, uh, whatever length that is. So you get these long carbon chains that are not broken down in the intestinal tract. Um, so they don't really have a lot of nutritive effects and animals and plants and even insects produce this. The main reason why animals produce waxes is they make things water resistant, they help to repel water and that's good because they kind of get a little bit sticky. So we make ear wax to keep our ears kind of protected from water. Sheep, so if you've ever seen wool, unprocessed wool, it has a certain uh, waxy consistency to it, and that's the lanolin. And the reason why the sheep do it is it gives them like a nice water repellent sweater or rain jacket. And it allows the water to beat up on so it doesn't penetrate it in. Um, wax use it for, or bees wax is mainly used as a structural support when they're making the hives. Uh, another herb on the left is bayberry. So this was used by early settlers. Those little seeds were collected and heated up, uh, warmed up. The wax was collected to make candles. You can still do that. Far more expensive than using beeswax or a synthetic wax, but it can be done. So, um, but it will cost you like 10 bucks a candle if you did it with, um, with Bayberry compared to like 10 cents for, for one made from synthetic or beeswax, okay? Um, so there are a few herbs. Medicinally, I don't know if there's a lot of benefits. Historically, they used to use uh, low-fat products. Uh, they would use wax to give it a fatty-like taste and consistency to it uh, because it would kind of mimic fat in a way when you're eating it. But 
uh, you don't absorb it, so it basically passes it through the intestinal tract and has no caloric effects, and then can cause like fatty stools, which is called steatorrhea. Uh, so fat is steato, rhea is to go, diarrhea, steatorrhea. Okay. So here's some fatty acids. Uh, on the left, we've got acetic acid, butyric acid, lauric acid, linoleic acid, and then you've got when you stick uh, one of those onto an ester or an alcohol, you get this ester bond that's basically the wax, okay? So not really super important, but these are worth knowing the difference between a wax uh, and a fatty acid and a fat. So another thing we'll talk about is latex. So latex is interesting because it's kind of like the mayonnaise of the, uh, of the plant kingdom, okay? And so... What latex is, is it's like a milky substance that is an emulsion of both polar and non-polar, so both water-soluble and fat-soluble substances, and it's in an aqueous space, and that's why I said it's like mayonnaise. So mayonnaise, you have, uh, you've got some fat, you've got some protein, uh, you've got some water, and it's blended up and gives you this milky-like consistency, okay? Um, on the left-hand side is the opium poppy, and so... In order to extract the opium out, they puncture uh, the opium pod uh, with a little knife and it oozes out this white latex gets excreted. And then they basically let it dry and they scrape it off and then you get a big thing of opium and then all the troubles start then, okay? So in this case, the opium poppy, poppy is excreting a number of compounds um, and the alkaloids in it are what uh, are responsible for its narcotic effects, okay? So there are lots of different plants that produce a latex. Uh, cousins of the opium poppy include greater chalandine and bloodroot. And these both grow locally around where I live here, but around where you guys are right now as well. Uh, these are in the opium family. Greater chalandine is used uh, uh, as an antispasmodic, it's a liver herb. Um, when you break the leaf, it produces this nice yellowy orange latex. You can see it there. Blood root, no surprise where it gets its name from here. This is the nice red latex that it excretes. These can both be applied topically to treat warts. Um, internally, I don't use them a lot. Cheldonium, I do use sometimes for, as an antispasmodic for, for cramping pains, but um, we'll talk about it again later on. So. The take home for latex is on the multiple choice exam. If I'm saying which of the following is found in latex, as soon as you see water in it, that's probably going to be your answer. Okay. So, water, protein, um, alkaloids, phenolic compounds. Like I have, could have any of those things, um, but it's in an aqueous base. Remember, it's mayonnaise. Unlike a gum or gum resin, um, which only has. Uh, doesn't really have water necessarily. It has more. Well, I guess you could actually have gums and to make it even more complicated. You could have gums and, and probably a latex as well for sure. Uh, but the resins don't have that uh, water base in it. Okay. So, any questions before I move on to terpenoids? This is the last section I want to get done today. So, terpenoids. So, terpenoids are classified based on how they're made, okay? And we've already discussed a few terpenoids already, the essential oil components and then the resins, okay? So, a terpenoid or a terpene is the, is the correct term. A terpene basically consists of, uh, is synthesized from isoprene units. And the isoprene unit is five carbon structures shown on the left-hand side. Um, that's the basic building block. So to make the very first terpene is called the mono, meaning one terpene, okay? So monoterpene is made of two isoprenes. So two isoprenes, so one isoprene is made of five carbons, two is made of 10. So therefore your monoterpenes have 10 carbons made of two isoprenes. Diterpenes, you just double up the mono, You'll get four isoprenes, and you're going to get 20 carbons. Triterpenoids, you get 30 carbons. Uh, tetraterpenoids, you get 40 carbons. 
And then there's another one that I missed out there, skipped over deliberately. It's called the sesquiterpene, uh, which is made from 1.5 carbon or 1.5 uh, terpenes. So it's actually made from three isoprenes. Okay. We'll go through this in a second. So that's the main classification of it. And there are some functional medicinal properties associated with the different classes. Uh, and there are some generalizations you can make with some of them. And some of them hold true with most of them, while other uh, are some specific, very, very specific examples. Okay. Now, I sometimes really say terpene and terpenoid and use those two interchangeably. The textbook definition of a terpene is a hydrocarbon, only carbons and hydrogens. A terpenoid is when there is the addition of an oxygen to a terpene. Okay. So, um, pinene, which is the uh, one of the main essential oils in turpentine, is a, a terpene, okay? And terpenoids are a whole bunch of other ones. In addition, iridoids, secadoids, iridoids, secoiridoids, sesquiterpenoids, steroidal saponins, cardiac glycosides, these are all technically terpenoids, okay? They have oxygens mixed in there. And some of the carotenoids do, and some of the... The, uh, uh, the carotenes do, and uh, I don't have any, and, and uh, other ones do, and we'll talk about those in a second. So this is the kind of actual chemistry involved, which you don't need to know. But the idea behind this is you stick a bunch of these isoprenes together. You might have here, you got six of them, makes this nice starting material called squalene that then basically cyclizes and down at the bottom here you can basically get steroid like compound found in plants and there's all these different classifications that may or may not have shown up on your slides uh if you have any slides that don't show up uh that have these little flow charts um i'm going to print a little put up a little pdf with a summary of all these little ones just because in order for me to get the, the file size down so it's small enough for you guys to download uh, some of my slides get converted from text to, uh, from, uh, these images are, aren't really legible. Okay. Sorry about that. So monotrip beams are the first ones. Here's the basic thing to get the mono, you need to, you need to use two isoprenes. So here's your alpha pinene. This is your very first terpene we're going to talk about. Uh, there's no oxygens. Therefore it's a terpene, not a terpenoid. Monoterpenes or monoterpenoids, 10 carbons, two isoprenes. That's an exam type of question I might ask. How many carbons, how many isoprenes uh, are found in a sesquiterpene, diterpene, monoterpene? So important ones to remember, menthol comes from peppermint. It's the main active compound in peppermint oil. Carbacrol and thymol. Remember we talked about when we were talking about classifying um, uh, compounds? This is the example of a monoterpenoid, and it's a essential oil, and it's also a phenolic compound, because if you look at the bottom up there, thymol and carbacrol has a phenolic group. Count up the carbons, you got 10 carbons on there. Nice small molecules, easy to evaporate. Uh, camphor, you, camphor is in uh, a lot of sports creams like Tiger Balm and A535. Eucalyptol is an eucalyptus oil, also on some uh, uh, some of the cough drops will contain peppermint oil like menthol, eucalyptol. Terp for all is the uh, main constituent in tea tree oil that acts as an antiseptic. It's also found in juniper oil, so when you're drinking gin, you are getting small amounts of that in you as well. So again, remember, when you're drinking peppermint tea or you're having... Uh, um, some Italian food or, um, you know, having a gin and tonic or whatever you may be doing, you are consuming essential oils, relatively small enough, but they are in there. As I mentioned earlier, when we talked about the essential oils, the aromatic oils, they have an antimicrobial effect. They tend to work by disrupting cell membrane. So unlike an antibiotic that's very precise and specific for it targets a certain uh, enzyme or protein, it's just generally kind of just irritating. It just kind of messes stuff up, makes their cell membranes uh, uh, leakier, and that can lead to death. If it's bugging me, if it's non-specific, it means it's also kind of bugging you a bit too. So again, high amounts, 
not only will affect the uh, the bugs, but will also affect you. Counter irritant because it basically irritates the uh, tissues and causes increased blood flow. Carminative helps with bloating gas. Analgesic, another thing I'll add in there, which you can apply to the other slide on the essential oils. Uh, these are found in sports creams and expectorant because they're found in cough drops and also uh, the essential oils are inhaled. Volatile, no color, non-polar. So thyme, peppermint, camphor. Camphor is a cousin of cinnamon. It's the same genus, different species of cinnamon, okay? Uh, both produce aromatic oils, but they are very different plants. So that's the first group monoterpenoids or monoterpenes. We're gonna talk about a subcategory of terpenoids called iridoids and secoiridoids. The iridoid molecule, basically this is what an iridoid is here. It's like you've got a carboxylic acid that's kind of cycled up, cyclized like this, okay? Iridane, secoiridane. Um, iridane was originally found in, I believe it was an ant that had this iridane-like compound, and that's where the name comes from. These are basically monoterpenes or monoterpenoid compounds um, that have what's called a lactone ring. So the lactone ring is, is this carboxylic acid group that's cyclized, and the iridane is that structural background. So I may have confused you guys there. Um, the, when you hear of a monoterpenoid, monoterpene lactone, which is either an iridoid or a secoiridoid, the first thing I think of is it tastes bitter. A lot of important medicinal plants that, that have a, a bitter taste to it will contain these. And so one of my favorite herbs called yellow gentian, which is used as a digestive bitter, basically contains a compound called amarogentin, which is uh, derived from this. The acrid bitter uh, substance in uh, olive oil, but also in the leaf uh, olive trees, uh, the leaf from the, from the uh, olive plant or uh, olive trees is also used in herbal medicine as well. The oleoropium is, is uh, classified um, as a monotrypian lactone and it has some bitter compounds in it that are important as well. Occupin, which is uh, in a few different species of um, uh, plantain, um, this has some healing properties associated with this. So. I didn't include the name here. So it's Plantago uh, lanceolata and uh, Plantago alvu, um, no, Plantago major. There's a couple of different ones, it's three different ones. So another one uh, I forgot to mention is what's called Devil's Claw. And this grows in South Africa. And this compound here is a glycoside, so you can see on the left there's a sugar. And on the right, you've got this, um, uh, it's like a caffeic acid derivative here. Um, and this is an important anti-inflammatory compound from, and this is an iridane. Occupin, which is found in the various plantago species, this is another glycoside that exists and has important vulnerary and healing properties associated with it. Amarogentin, which is the bitter compound in, in yellow gentian, um, it has some anti-inflammatory properties, it's bitter. Um, it, in addition, to the seco iridoid, it also has the sugar attached to it, make it more water soluble. And then this little weird phenol compound stuck on there as well, um, which has some other health benefits, I'm sure. So when you consume it, I don't know, this probably dissociates to some degree in your gut as well, just because the acid will clean off some of these compounds. So it's almost like a double, uh, a double glycoside here. You know, you've got the secoiridoid compound and this polyphenol compound stuck on there. And then finally, on the right hand side, you've got the oleoropin, which is uh, going to be a higher amounts in the leaves. Less of this is going to be found in the oil just because uh, it's somewhat water soluble. Uh, and this compound in here is going to be responsible for the bitterness right in the middle. Okay. So those are the mono. Terpene lactones. Sesoterpenes are the next group. These are no longer monoterpenes. These are the sesler. So they're made of not two isoprenes, but they're made of three. So sesler in Latin or Greek or whatever language it's from means 1.5 or one and a half. And that's where you get the three isoprene units. Okay. So 
there are a number of these things. Uh, humulene is one of the important aromatic compounds in uh, hops that gives it uh, sort of a, a certain smell to it. Also, you'll find it because hops is used to make beer is a cousin, is in the same family as marijuana is. And so marijuana also produces humulene. And it's one of the volatile components in the uh, that the flowers release that give it a certain kind of, kind of odor, which is also probably uh, one of the odors that uh, drug sniffing dogs detect um, uh, when they're looking for for drugs. And I would imagine that you could get a drug sniffing dog falsely uh, going off if you had a bag of hops in your suitcase um, as well. So. Uh, Caryophyllines in a few different herbs, including clove, zingiberine is found in uh, ginger. And so the active ingredient in some of these uh, herbs may not, this may not be the primary compounds, but they do have some effect in the body. Okay. Um, Despotropian lactones to me are a very important group of compounds. And these have the lactone group, like I showed you with the iridoids and the cicloiridoids. And whenever I think of these um, these uh, lactone groups, they're very bitter. So some of the classic digestive herbs like wormwood contain uh, absinthin, which is a dimer of two sesquiterpene lactone molecules stuck together, okay? And the other sesquiterpene lactone, I remember from the Chinese wormwood that's used as an antimalarial is a sesquiterpene lactone. Okay, so they have antimicrobial effects. They have digestive bitter, effect, uh, digestive bitter effects. Um, many of these have anti-inflammatory effects. There's something in the wormwood that seems to help keep Crohn's patients in remission longer when taken. At least one study shows that. Some of these may have some vulnerary effects. We know that, for example, chamomile has a mattress in a certain cyclotropine uh, lactone in it that exerts some healing properties on damaged tissues. So it's used for topically and internally for ulcers and other skin issues. Uh, many of the members of the Asteraceae family have these things in it, including things like lettuce. Uh, lactucin is another example of the sesquiterpene lactone that gives lettuce, like romaine lettuce, that white latex will contain these sesquiterpene lactones and give it a bitter sort of property to it, okay? Um, so here's chamomile on the left, which looks almost the same as fever few on in the middle there. These have these both have various sesquiterpene lactones. Chamomile mainly for digestion, fever cues for inflammation, for fevers obviously, and also for migraines. And then lactucin, which is shown on the right, is in chicory, and that's the same compound you can find uh, eating uh, eating lettuce uh, as well. Okay, so these all act as uh, the chicory is a good digestive bitter used for gallstones, um, supports your liver. Um, so they all have a bitter taste associated with these things. The next group I'm going to talk about are diterpenes. So diterpenes made from four isoprenes, 20 carbons. Now, these are a little harder to make generalizations about. Uh, some of these have some interesting neurological effects. So marijuana, the active ingredient, one of the active ingredients is THC, and it's basically a diterpenoid, diterpene. When I was in university, I was working for Merck, one of the big drug companies, and uh, my project, I didn't choose it, but my project was actually making uh, cannabinoid analogs, uh, which is kind of fun. And just as an aside, one night I was rushing to get out the door on a Friday afternoon, and I added substance A, and then substance B, but I was supposed to do substance B and then substance A. And what was funny is I had a reaction take place. And to make a long story short, I found like a shortcut on how to make it, mainly because I was in a hurry and I made a mistake. And I ended up getting a couple, couple of publications out of it. So most uh, brilliant discoveries are usually made by people doing stupid things. And, uh, and I did one of those. So kind of a fun, fun little story. Um, so... As again, these resins are going to be fat soluble. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, marijuana is not really easy to extract in tea form. One of the ways that people will extract it is they'll use butter as a solvent 
to dissolve the THC and the other um, uh, fat soluble compounds that exert their, the medicinal effects, and then you can cook with the butter. So you do a simple extraction using butter to get it, and then you can make your cookies or whatever and uh, keep it out of reach of your children. Okay. Um, Steviol is a natural artificial sweetener. Um, I think it's probably better than a lot of them. Uh, so it interacts with your taste buds and exerts some effects. I think it's certainly safer than any other artificial sweetener. I do think taking artificial sweeteners still fools your body. It may not be great for you to have too much of, but Steviol seems okay. Salvinorum A is a compound that's found in what's called Salvia divinorum. It's diviner's sage, and it's a... Uh, a plant used in a certain region of Mexico by shamans, unlike a lot of the other hallucinogens like ayahuasca, magic mushrooms, LSD, even peyote, it doesn't interact with serotonin receptors. It actually interacts with a certain opioid receptor that has no analgesic properties to it, but causes weird hallucinations. And that's one of the reasons why people take a lot of opiates for, for a long period of time to start kind of act a little bit funny because it, it, you know, opium is a hallucinogen in high amounts uh, as chronically, but this substance, uh, I don't know if it's, it, for a while it's commercially available, like you could buy it at you know, those marijuana stores or head shops and things like that. And kids were uh, basically smoking it and, and people watch YouTubes of kids freaking out and it gives you a very high, uh, short little duration where you hallucinate. But not really designed. That's not how Shamans took it originally. And it, and from what I've heard, no one really, very few people enjoy the experience and choose to to repeat it. And uh, I had one patient who got some for his birthday once and and did it for a week straight. And uh, it only lasts for ten or fifteen minutes, but it's kind of pretty wacky. And he ended up getting committed to like a mental institute because it made it a little bit crazy. So not a good thing to do. Um, I don't recommend that. And then the compound at the bottom is found in Vitex and some other herbs, and it may have some hormonal regulating effects through dopamine receptors. I'm going to finish these slides. If you got to go, you got to go, okay? Uh, triterpenoids, these guys, 30 carbons. Uh, there's a few different ways that these triterpenoids or triterpenes may exist. It can be a five-membered ring or a four-membered ring. One of these four-membered rings has a steroid-like backbone, so no surprise that it can interact with steroid hormones in your body. Now, to start off, one, the, one triterpene, which um, is found in a lot of uh, herbs and spices, is ursolic acid. And I think this is a really interesting compound that has um, might have some positive effects on the cardiovascular system, uh, seem to have some anti-cancer effects, may have antiviral effects, um, lots of great things, and you can get it by eating fruits and vegetables and spices that contain it. So berries will have some, apples will, and various herbs, including rosemary, will have that. Rosemary has this compound, essential oils, and another comp and some other compounds as well. Uh, I'm a big fan of rosemary. I take a little bit every day when I can. Um, the other thing. is a group of compound called terpenoid glycosides. So thapanins are basically, what they are is they form soap when you add them to water and shake them up. And you've got a water-soluble component, and then you have a fat-soluble component. And the advantage of that is this is a way that certain herbs are able to be therapeutically extracted using an aqueous solvent like water. Because normally, um, a triterpenoid is not water-soluble at all. And it would be like things found in resins where you can't dissolve in water. But, for example, glycerizin, which is found in licorice, has both the sugar molecules and the fat molecules, making it a really good uh, water-soluble thing that can form soap. The other advantage of that is when you have a saponin like found in licorice, licorice in Chinese medicine is found in a lot of Chinese formulas, and there's... They say that licorice helps the other herbs enter the meridians. That's kind of what they say. I don't really know what they mean by that. But what I think chemically they mean by that is licorice may act as a soap to dissolve other fat-soluble components that might otherwise not dissolve in water. And so certain herbs like licorice shall have it in it. Uh, some of the ginsengs will also have it in it. 
Um, in general, a lot of them have anti-inflammatory effects, anti-cancer effects, antiviral effects. They're water-soluble, and like a lot of the terpenoids are, and they're non-volatile because they're huge compounds. So in, under hydrolysis, because again, glycerizin is a glycoside with a lot of acid, with certain enzyme reactions, uh, a lot of heat, uh, those sugar molecules can be released, uh, can be removed, causing uh, the release of uh, glycerotinic acid. Uh, and that compound has some good therapeutic effects, but it can also elevate blood pressure. So one of the problems with liquors, if you eat too many licorice candies that have real licorice in it, there are case reports of people getting what's called pseudo-aldosteronism, which is uh, the, the uh, glycerotinic acid uh, inhibits the breakdown of cortisol to cortisone, and cortisol mimics aldosterone in its, in its effects in the body to some degree, causing water retention because it causes sodium retention, and as a result, elevate blood pressure. So, large amounts of licorice long term can elevate blood pressure, and you have to be careful about that. And that's why there are some licorice products that are called DGL, which have had this glycerin kinetic acid removed, so you can take it safely long term. But it doesn't have some of the properties that the uh, original licorice extract had. Yeah, I gotta go over. Sorry, guys, just so I can complete this. Triterpenoids. So, steroidal saponins. Steroidal saponins are uh, steroid like compounds with sugars attached. And there are a number of these that are really clinically important. Strigloside, ginsenosides, eleutherosides all contain that triterpenoid background that looks like a steroid. And appreciate stress messes up everything in your body because it competes with steroid hormones in your body. Cortisol suppresses uh, immune function, reproduction, uh, can do all sorts of bad things. A lot of the herbs that contain steroidal saponins are used to combat stress. They're called adaptogens. They help the body cope with stress. And so they have anti-inflammatory effects because it can modulate uh, some of the places where cortisol target. They, if cortisol is too high or too low, it can bring it up or down depending, just like phytoestrogens can stimulate or block estrogen receptors. Uh, cholesterol is a steroid and so it can modulate the sense of cholesterol in the body uh, because it's working on some of the sex hormones. It can stimulate libido and re have positive effects on reproduction and fertility. Um, your heart is affected by cortisol, so it can act as a gentle heart tonic as well. And finally, it modulates the immune system, just like how cortisol suppresses it. It can block the suppressive effect of cortisol on the body and have a modulating effect. And a lot of these adaptogens are used to boost the immune system, uh, to increase white blood cell count, have an indirect antiviral effect. So I take uh, adaptogens every day, especially because I'm sleep deprived having a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And so these kind of help to... Uh, make my energy more balanced throughout the day, it balances my blood sugar, uh, helps reduce the risk of getting infections, improves your moods, uh, make you feel better, and they may promote longevity. Adaptogenic herbs, like ginseng, sarbarian ginseng, astragalus, uh, may help prevent the shortening of telomeres. Uh, and there's some studies that support that. And uh, when we're under stress, we age quicker for some reason. And so we know that these adaptogens appear to slow down the shortening of telomeres. Um, that's one of the reasons, for example, reishi mushroom, which also contains triterpenoids, um, uh, uh, steroidal saponins, is called the mushroom of immortality. So these are all used in Asian medicine to promote longevity, overall health, and they're called panaceous, cure-all. Now, one other interesting uh, steroid, now this is not a uh, steroid of glycoside, it's just a phytosteroid, is uh, ectotheroid. And I always wondered why Popeye, uh, he was always, you know, when I was watching uh, Popeye cartoons as a kid, he was eating spinach to get strong. He was never eating whey protein powder. He was never, um, uh, you know, eating lots of meat. Uh, he was eating spinach. And... What's interesting is one, spinach has two things that can help 
for weightlifters. One, it ha contains high, high amounts of uh, nitrates, like a lot of leafy green vegetables do, which has a vasodilating effect. And we know that uh, leafy greens improve athletic performance. So that's one thing. The second thing is it contains this steroid-like compound that there are several reports of it improve, acting as an anabolic substance and enhances performance and helps build muscle. And so it appears to mediate somehow through one of the estrogen receptor binding. I don't know exactly what it does. So I don't know a lot about the research. I'm sure the supplement industry will want to concentrate this uh, and promote it as, uh, as, or maybe exploit it would be a better word, uh, as, a, as a substance to help build muscle mass. My concern with that is that when you eat it in spinach, I'm 100% certain it's good for you. However, if you take high amounts of it in isolation, it may become more like supplementing with another anabolic compound and cause problems, more problems than good. But who knows? Uh, research is limited, but we have to be careful about uh, taking high amounts of these things. So eat your spinach, but maybe avoid the substance of these now until it's established as safe. Um, Triterpenoid steroidal saponins is another group called cardiac glycosides. So remember when we talked about digoxin? It's one of the first medicines used for congestive heart failure, where it acts as a positive ionotropic, which increases the force of contractions of the heart, and negative chronotropic, which means it slows down the heart rate, and that makes the heart pump more effectively to uh, prevent, uh, you know, uh, to allow for the proper return of blood to the heart, okay? Now, the structure of this, it has a steroid backbone, backbone to it. And what's interesting in herbal med, so this is a very strong drug that you can die if you don't take it properly. And it works on the heart and you can overdose and stuff like that, which is scary. What's interesting is the adaptogens have a similar structure to it and they're very safe. And what's I found really interesting. Some of the herbs like astragalus and, and ginseng, they're actually used to improve, to help with edema, whether it's like swelling in the ankles. And they act as a diuretic and they also can help improve uh, heart rate and stuff. So they may be gentle cardiac glycosides in many ways that are very, very safe. So maybe for early congestive heart failure, they may be appropriate to be used. And when you look at the Chinese uh, sort of diagnosis and they kind of match some of that. So anyway, just an interesting little side note. But the cardiac glycosides, I would say uh, Fox Club uh, contains digoxin, and that's the classic one. Whether or not, I may be the only one who thinks that uh, adaptogens have some uh, cardiac glycoside like properties. So. Last slide, I promise, and then we're adding it. Tetraterpenoids, you probably haven't heard of tetraterpenoids or tetraterpenes before today but I'm sure all of you have heard of carotenoids. So these are 40 carbons, so they're made from eight isoprenes, fat soluble, and they're colored. So these are the first group where we really see some color, yellow, orange, or red. And the reason for that is because they're long, long hydrocarbons with these conjugated double bonds that absorb uh, and reflect light in the visible spectrum, okay? The two main classes are carotenes, which are the tetraterpenes, and xanthophylls, which are tetraterpenoids. So one has oxygens, one don't. So these are all important antioxidants in your body. And they work as part of the team of other antioxidants. So supplementing with beta carotene is not the same as eating a diet rich in carotenoids because not only is there beta carotene, but there are lots of other carotenoids and phenolic compounds and vitamin C and vitamin E that all work together as a team to sequester those antioxidants. So these are important but you have to do them with other ones. Some of them have anti-inflammatory properties. Many of them have anti-cancer properties, help protect against skin cancer, prostate cancer. Some of them also have an anti-diabetic effect through interacting with various uh, cell receptors to do things that I don't really understand what they do, but they do stuff. Uh, beta carotene acts as a pro-vitamin A, so it's used by the body to make vitamin A. And then finally, um, they're also a master pigment, and so People who get macular degeneration and damage to the uh, to the eye are often recommended as supplement, or in addition, you know, also eat more vegetables that contain these uh, to prevent macular degeneration. Okay. Now, the crap noise. 
or the tetraterpenoids, these little OH groups interact with the water, so they're likely to sort of bridge um, bridge the uh, cell membranes like this. The lycopenes, they're fat soluble, they're going to go in between. So those are two examples. The carotenes are going to be the beta carotene, lycopene, those are the two you've heard of. The orange color in carrots, the red color in tomatoes, these contain no oxygens. They're important for all sorts of different things. You get them in pumpkin and carrots and squash. Uh, the red color in tomatoes, you also can get in watermelon, grapefruit, and this other uh, fruit from Thailand, I think called duck. Uh, sounds like a Klingon fruit. Um, and then your xanthophils include lutein and zeaxanthin, which are found in high amounts in kale, spinach, avocado, also some herbs like calendula, the flower will have that color in it. Caps, uh, capsanthin, which is found in bell peppers and cayenne peppers, that nice red color. Cryptoxanthin, also found in red peppers, pumpkins, papaya. And then astaxanthin, which is the nice, beautiful color in salmon that makes it red. And if you eat farm salmon, the diet that they feed the farm salmon is void of the, uh, the little uh, the fish and the krill and whatever else the salmon eating that are responsible for making the astaxanthin. So they actually have to supplement it uh, with astaxanthin so it retains some of the color. So if you look at uh, wild sockeye salmon, this nice, rich red color. Farm salmon is pretty pale and awful looking. Also, they, chances are they don't feed it the omega-3 rich foods. They feed it probably corn and stuff. So don't eat farm salmon if you're gonna eat it. Um, you gotta eat wild, assuming there's some wild salmon still left on the planet in the next decade, but anyways. Uh, another interesting plant is called achiote, which is uh, sometimes referred to as lipstick uh, plant. It produces this beautiful red pigment. That's uh, I'm down on the Amazon there. That's Teddy, one of the guys I've done ayahuasca with. Uh, that's the uh, substance that's used uh, as part of the face paint by the indigenous people in the in the Amazon. Also, it's used commercially in natural makeups like lipstick. Uh, Baby Bell cheese, that nice red waxy coating. They use, I think they still use this as the uh, coloring for that. So it's a beautiful natural pigment, nice and red. Uh, and it does have some additional properties. They also use it in uh, Latin cooking to uh, to make uh, food nice color. Um, and I don't know what precisely this does medicinally, but I'm sure that it does a lot. So the main indications for uh, carotenoids, Various eye issues, macular degeneration, light sensitivity. So if someone finds that they're, they're always squinting and lights are too bright, you know, eat some more vegetables. Uh, cataract prevention as well. So uh, as you get older, these become more and more important as well. Cardiovascular system, they help to they float around with the fats and help protect your arteries from becoming oxidized. Some of them will lower blood pressure as well, prevent stroke. Skin, they do two things. They deposit in your skin, giving your skin a nice orangey, tinge to it, uh, and the presence of them, they can help to absorb some of the free radicals that cause damage to the skin, and they also make you more attractive, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, with cancer, a number of these interact with various receptors on cells to help with skin cancer, as I mentioned, but also prostate cancer, in particular lycopene does that. And then as I mentioned earlier, some anti-diabetic properties through some mechanism I don't know anything about. Lots of great things, but you want to eat these, don't take a supplement, eat them. And this is a fun little study. What they found is they took someone's face and they used Photoshop to change the hue. So they made it look like a carotenoid rich diet or someone who's tanning or someone who's just white. And then they got people to rate the attractiveness of, of it. And uh, basically eating vegetables makes you sexier than suntan, which is the conclusion for this. And there's a couple studies they did this for. So not only does it protect your skin from aging, it gives it a nice hue color and also prevents skin cancer. So the take home is eat your vegetables, okay? So I'm done. I went way over, I'm sorry, but I wanted to have that finished just so your package was done. You could, hopefully uh, you guys didn't get kicked out of the room, but anyways. So you guys have a wonderful week. If you have any questions, actually, I actually got a couple here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you don't need to know the chemical structures, but anything written on the text and word might be fair game, but I'll give you some examples uh, next time what you need to know. I'm gonna, I, I'll be very clear. Uh, are diterpenes in stevia what are responsible for the 
busting the biofilms, if so, could THC have the potential to the same? Uh, I don't know. Usually essential oils bust biofilms. I know monotropines do that. Cephalotropines probably can do that. I don't know if diterpenes can. Um, so, I don't know. So, if you have any other questions, uh, you can post on the forum. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Okay? Bye for now.